of physiotherapy, and he's also going to talk a little bit about nutrition. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invite to talk here to SR UK. Uh, nice to see a, a completely packed room, and I believe there's some people also following us on social media. So uh, I hope I can hold your attention uh, for the slots I have got. Um, so my name is Will Gregory. I'm a consultant physiotherapist based at Salford Royal Hospital in Manchester. Uh, I'm delighted to say greetings from the south, which is probably fair to say to this audience. <laughs> Um, so we have a specialist interest in scleroderma at Salford Royal and I've been the lead physio there since 2004. So I've seen a fair amount of the diagnosis and hopefully there's some stuff I've picked up that could be useful uh, for you guys. I'm also going to talk um, a, a little bit about some research that I did funded by SR UK and um, we'll talk through some case studies as well to get some ideas of the things that we've done that have helped. Uh, the, the people we look after, and, and then as soon just 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 into the last 15 minutes of my time, I'm going to present some work, uh, some slides from the dietitians in our service about what you can do for your diet and the the, the GI problems that you might find with uh, living with scleroderma. So why have you got a physiotherapist stood up here? I, I probably represent physiotherapy, but maybe slightly broader um, rehabilitation, which includes your um, occupational therapist, your hand therapist, perhaps your speech and language therapist. We're all there to try and improve the outcomes of those people living uh, with this condition. From our point of view in physiotherapy, well, it, it's been fairly well established that the musculoskeletal, the joint muscle uh, and skin problems are, are, are apparent for most people with this condition. So about 90% of people will complain of musculoskeletal problems at some stage of living uh, with scleroderma. Now, I'm going to take you way back to 1983 for my first reference, which is before most of you in this room were born, looking around. <laughs> um, so um, this was 1983, uh, this, this Dr. Askew wrote about um, what should we be doing from a physiotherapy point of view for people with this condition. And even at that point, there was this idea that observations imply physiotherapy should help to minimize contracture, so to keep your movements as good as possible. It should help to improve strength, and also to improve your skin compliance or flexibility. So this is, I can't do the maths, but quite a few years ago, uh, nearly 40 years ago in fact, that people were already talking about what we do for people with established scleroderma, how can we improve their day to day. So there was a survey of our patients in Salford uh, undertaken in 2003, and we asked all of our patients um, what uh, symptoms are you most frequently affected by with your scleroderma? Uh, and 79%, the top of the, the symptoms listed, was stiff joints, 75% uh, was pain, and 75% was fatigue. I don't know if that's something that rings true to those of you sat in the room, but these sit higher, certainly when we asked at that stage for our patients and the problems that they um, experience. So, if we move swiftly on to what's around now at the end of this decade, uh, there was a lot of interest in the British Society of Rheumatology creating a guideline for the treatment of systemic sclerosis or, or scleroderma. And I keenly went to the lecture theatre um, in, I think it must have been April 2017, waiting to hear what's been said. And I sat there for half an hour, it was a fantastic talk, incredible detail, fair amount of it over my head, um, but how much did they say about rehabilitation? Nothing. Nothing. So this was a document talking about the evidence for treatments, and the point was there wasn't sufficient evidence for rehabilitation in this condition to hit the criteria to get into this document. However, uh, the next year there was a European, so the BSR was British, this is the European guideline, published the year after, I suspect they were both working around the same time, and they did at least uh, accept this lack of evidence 
and their eighth research agenda point was we should be looking at evaluating the effectiveness of non-drug treatments in this condition. So there is a big push to try and work on this. There has been lots of research, and I'm going to talk you through that, but at the moment it's hard to do the research at the level that's considered um, scientific enough to hit national and international um, guidance. So, um, there's been a few literature reviews. Um, there's a fantastic one from a few years ago, uh, from Linda Williams, and I recently met Maya Spivitovich, uh, who has done an even more recent literature <coughs> review, and I was just reading her write-up of it on the train up here today, and I'm glad to say it's fairly similar to the literature I myself did about five years ago. <coughs> so this isn't quite the latest search, but it's my search, so I feel I should talk about this with you. There's a couple of things to add to it, but it's where we are pretty much uh, here in 2019. So if we go back to 1983, the first bit of uh, physiotherapy and scleroderma uh, research documents, uh, we can find within that period 113 articles. So the research is being done, people do care, people are passionate about this area, However, of those 113 studies, when I looked at them in more detail, unfortunately, 101 of them had to be excluded from further analysis, and we ended up with 11 good quality studies to look at for the kind of things we should be doing uh, in this condition. So, 11 studies. Um, if we just have a look at what they talked about, and I apologise, the type's quite small here. This is probably my most complex slide. It gets a lot uh, less challenging from here. Um, but the numbers look at how strong the evidence is. So the lower the number here, the stronger uh, the evidence is for that treatment. So we've got a four, that means somebody thinks it works somewhere, but we're not sure. We've got a one, that means there's been multiple trials that consistently show the benefit of this treatment for scleroderma. So, uh, if we just run through the treatments at this stage, we've got quite good scores for wax therapy that I'm going to talk about, for hydrotherapy that I'm not going to talk too much about, uh, for hand stretches we'll talk about, and if you're happy to, you might well join me in practicing them today. Uh, the same for mouth stretches. We'll talk a little bit about manual therapy, we'll talk about lymph drainage very briefly, and then the, the, one of the highest scores is this combined rehab, which is basically throw everything at you and see what helps. Um, finally, fitness work is quite highly scored, and massage as a form of manual therapy separately also scores fairly high. Uh, these are studies from around the world, and some of these treatments you will access easily in the UK, and some of them you won't. And as we'll discuss later, there are other areas in Europe where you might get easier access to these things. We're not offering flights anywhere in Europe, just so that you know where we are at this stage. But I wanted to give you an idea of the global picture of what's being done. So, um, the four areas I'm going to focus on are hand stretches, uh, mouth opening stretches, heat treatment, and particularly the wax baths that was my research. And we're going to touch on general fitness work uh, as well. So, uh, wax baths first off. This black and white photo shows a wax bath. Um, anybody seen one of these before? Can I have a show of hands if you don't mind? Oh yeah, what are we on? About 40, 50% of you, thank you very much, uh, have, have seen this machine. Now this black and white photo looks very dated. I must say it's Salford we had a machine just like that until about eight years ago. So the NHS moves quite slowly in some ways. Um, these days, if you want to use wax treatment, it tends to be uh, a smaller bath, like the one on the bottom left there, and that's actually the machine we used in our research trial, and we gave it to people to take home. And performing wax treatment in your own house probably means you can do it more regularly than what we used to do in dragging you to hospital to use uh, this machine. So it's level two evidence. When I started my research, there were three studies about it. Uh, there's also very good evidence, although quite old, for its use in other rheumatology diagnoses, particularly rheumatoid uh, arthritis. Um, there's good patient feedback on using it if you are able to use it. We'll talk about that in a moment. And like I say, the home use machines are there. Now, 
Um, I was at the World Scleroderma Congress, the second World Scleroderma Congress, we just about to have the sixth one in February, happens every two years, so it must be about seven, seven and a half years ago, I stood on stage and said, wax bath, seems quite a good idea, and a lady in the audience stood up and said, oh, I'm one of the physiotherapists from Switzerland, uh, when we see people and we diagnose it, they're given the wax bath on the day, they take it home and it's theirs for life. <laughs> And I thought, why don't we do that here? <laughs> and that's where my research question came from, but we'll, we'll come on to that in a bit. Um, so warm wax baths, they've been around since the early 1900s, so 100 years use of, were, were of using this kind of treatment. Why do we think it works? Well, the paraffin, and it's a different kind of paraffin to your candle, so please don't be pouring candles onto <laughs> various places. Um, it's a, it's a, it is a different kind of paraffin that melts at a much uh, lower temperature, so it tends to melt at somewhere between 45 and 55 degrees C, so it's a pleasant warmth rather than the scold you'd get with candle wax. Um, because of the property of the wax, it tends to penetrate a bit deeper the heat and last a bit longer. And this is, I, I said this is my oldest paper, 1983, it's not. This is 1955 and 1939 they were talking about the wax. We think it can help uh, with decreasing pain threshold by getting circulation going, getting you used to using the hands. Um, it can reduce stiff joints. And perhaps the way we tend to find its benefit is it warms up the hands, increases the circulation so that then the exercises you do after are more effective. We think it can help with chronic swelling as well. Uh, if you've got acute swelling, if you, if you sat here with a mixture of scleroderma and in inflammatory arthritis, then heat for acute swelling is a bad idea. But heat for long-term swelling can be, uh, can be helpful. Um, there's another picture of a wax bath up there. And then the other thing that's quite interesting in the research is the idea of using a paintbrush or similar. So, similar. so for a part of your body that you can't dunk into the bath, you could use a brush to brush it on. Uh, so, I'm going to start us on our world tour. We're thinking about the three studies thus far, the first one uh, was from 1991 in America, and they used the wax bath. They had it in the room next to the rheumatology consultant, I think, and when you came in for your review, you were set, asked, would you like to use a wax bath whilst you're here? Oh, yes, please, why not? Had one treatment, and they evaluated the outcome of it, and it looked like it helped with pain levels and helped with movement, a one-off treatment. <coughs> A few years passed until the next uh, study, and we're moving to Sweden here, uh, where Gunnar Sandqvist uh, did a study, um, I think with about 16 or 20 participants in, and they treated one hand, but didn't treat the other hand, and then they compared the outcomes after a period of the hand that had had regular wax treatment to the hand that hadn't. Uh, and, and then finally at the stage when we were writing our, our plan, there was a study uh, of, of three um, participants who had uh, the regular wax bath in 2009, and that was Janet Poole and the team over in America that did that. Now, I, I've got a red box here, and apologies if this excludes some of you in the room, but we do not recommend the use of hot wax if you have digital ulcers. If there is some skin breakdown, it's not a good idea to be putting that level of heat over it. Uh, we think around a quarter of people with scleroderma have digital ulcers, so we've already lost some people we could have helped with this treatment. There is, of course, an option to keep the finger with the ulcer out of the wax and maybe use the brush or, and the other digits. Um, I'm yet to have convinced anybody to start doing that, though. Um, so if that was wax, let's have a think about um, hand uh, function and, and hand movement. Uh, and this is another study out of America that looked at what happens over five years as you follow someone with scleroderma and hand uh, limitations. Um, and it's not particularly exciting reading, I'm afraid, because it does show the natural course is that the hand impairment continues uh, and over time uh, functional ability can be limited with it. So the things you want to do with your hands become uh, more difficult. And that's why it's a key area for us to treat uh, and for us to research. So if we think about what stretches should you be doing, again, if we look at the research to date, uh, there's some nice... Um, work from Sweden again from Gunnar Sankvist's team. Uh, they have shown st 
statistically improved hand movement, improvement in strength, and uh, less pain uh, as well with these patients doing regular um, hand exercises. Uh, a slightly more intensive program from America looked at um, a combination of wrist uh, and hand exercises. And then as I say, the three studies with the wax were in there as well. And all showing good promise of regular hand uh, stretch work. The most recent piece of work came with this multimodal uh, study um, out of the Netherlands. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've got the right flag there. I presented this once and I, I was told I had the French flag, so apologies. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the correct one. Minor uh, potential uh, problem there. Uh, and, and it did show with these hand stretches in combination with other treatments, we got better grip, better quality of life, and a quicker walking speed as well. So it is possible to, to push along a few different areas. However, when I was researching this, my favourite set of exercises are these ones. Uh, out of the research team in Japan. Now, most of the studies are 15 people, 20 people. This one had 45 people in the study, and they showed doing a month of these stretches improved your movement at the end of the month. Great, fair enough. What was vital was doing a month of these stretches improved your movement 12 months later. So we could fight that potential deterioration of hand function and actually have a longer term uh, impact of uh, that kind of work. So I think they're quite good, but I don't know what you guys think, so I'm going to ask you to have a try if that's okay. Uh, if your hands are up to it, you might just want to loosen them off at this stage. This is everyone joining in. Um, there are three stretches, um, and the first one we're going to look at is, is can you make like an O shape? Uh, with your index finger, let's use, and your thumb. And then from that position, you're going to use your other hand to push on that knuckle to make it as straight as possible. Okay, holding it about 10 seconds, that's stretch number one. Stretch number two is a bit easier to explain. So you're holding the tip of your finger and pulling it back as far as you can. Okay, and the final one, curling your finger as best as you can, pushing on the fingernail to increase that curl. So that was the routine, and I think it's fairly easy to do and become a regular habit. Uh, I should say the thumb isn't involved in that routine, and the thumb movement tends to be more spared in scleroderma, so the thumb doesn't tend to have as much of an impact, which is why the thumb was missed out on that routine. So that's your basic baseline hand treatment. We'll do the thumb exercises in a bit, but... Um, just to talk you through that. So uh, this is the actual research study, and I was very fortunate to receive a research grant from SRUK to perform this, uh, this research. And um, it was something that we've talked about a few times at meetings like this, you know, what should we be looking at that can improve the day-to-day -day life of the people that we're caring for? And uh, this question came through discussions with a number of people in these meetings, and. Um, a number of my expert patients, if we're going to call them that, said, yeah, this seems like a good thing. We should definitely be looking at this uh, research. Um, and because the hand exercises were fairly well established, it was therefore necessary that everyone in the study did the hand exercises. But then we got half of the study using the wax bath and the half of the study not uh, using the wax bath. Um, as I said, we're quite lucky in Salford to be a specialist centre, so we do see quite a lot of people with scleroderma coming through. Even then, getting 36 people on the deadline was quite challenging. The last three were recruited on the final day of recruitment, so that's why I've lost some of my hair, um, at least, uh, an explanation. Um, and, and then we looked at 
the measurements for what was happening to these people before they went into the study. We looked at hand movements, we looked at um, uh, rated ability to do things, and um, we also looked at the modified Bodman skin score that has been mentioned already uh, this afternoon. So this is the hand movement test, and this is the Hamis score, which looks at nine different movements and gives you a score from zero to three in regard to how much of that movement you can perform. And it's scored for both left hand and then right hand. And that was our key measure. Can we make a difference to actual hand movements? That was the thing we really wanted to improve over the study. Um, those that had the wax bath uh, were given it to take home and asked to use it three or four times a week. Uh, for a nine week period, so two months. Um, and those that didn't have the wax bath were asked to do two months of the hand exercises. Uh, of course, those with the wax bath did do the hand exercises um, as well. At the end of that nine weeks, we measured, and then we brought them back a further two months after and re measured at that point to look at the long term impact. Um, and this is a big frustration, I must say, in that we found. Although there was a hint, there wasn't statistically significant difference between the improvements of one group and uh, the other. Although, if we look at the data here, um, now the diagonal line there would imply that you've not changed at all over the course of the study. Any of the dots below the line um, are people who have got increased hand movement over the study period. I'm sincerely hoping uh, uh, the statistician I work with isn't watching this because he will tell me off because that is just a lot of dots and the clear statistics is no significant benefit. But without wanting to say it out loud, there's some things you could look at there and think about the, the potential for looking at these programs for yourself. Um, it did show though that actually using the wax bath at home was manageable, it was tolerable. People managed to do the treatments they had planned, and also they managed to do the hand exercises they planned. And, you know, um, SRUK were kind enough to fund the study, which included buying 36 of these wax baths that still sit in the homes of the participants of our study. So there's more wax baths out there, um, and uh, we've still got loads and loads of wax. If anyone is a keen wax user, um, we can always... Um, uh, help you with your supplies. It used to be available on prescription actually, paraffin wax used to be a prescribed substance, unfortunately that's dropped off. And I, <coughs> my aim of having the wax bath prescribed along with the wax has unfortunately not uh, come to fruition. I will move swiftly on from that. So, um, first case study, uh, we're going to talk about this chap who came in uh, to our clinic um, he'd had the condition since 1998, so we'd had it for a long time really, but uh, the Raynaud had come first with some muscle weakness and skin tightening, and it was later diagnosed as a limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis with a polymyositis overlap as well. Um, he came to see us because he's had a wrist fracture, a, a, an injury that wasn't really related to the diagnosis, but he turned up uh, probably about three or four months after the wrist fracture, having been treated at his local hospital, came to us and said, it's still not moving all that well. Um, and not moving all that well translated to the following movement. So the extension of the wrist was about 30 degrees. You should be getting about 70 degrees of the fully healthy wrist. The flexion was at around 40 degrees, and you should be getting about 90. So it was about half as much movement as you might anticipate. Um, so what did we do for him? Well, he was one of our first uh, trialists uh, before we did the formal research uh, using uh, a wax bath, uh, which we actually had in department at that time. But we also did some hands-on, this isn't him by the way, uh, we also did some hands-on stretches, working on the wrist, giving it a good uh, uh, going over and trying to get the movement improved. Um, and the protocol we used came out of this Italian group. Uh, when you look at uh, the evidence base for rehabilitation in scleroderma, I mentioned there were 11 papers. Of those 11 papers, three came from the same funding stream in Italy uh, in, in 2008, 2009. Um, so they really added massively to the research out there, this, this group from Italy. And we tried to copy their uh, regime for the wrist and hand uh, movement for this chap. And what did we do? 
Well, we, and this is three or four months after uh, the break and after we'd had some standard physiotherapy, so we thought some more intensive work was worthwhile. We doubled the amount of wrist extension he had and we almost doubled the amount of wrist flexion he had. As a physiotherapist, we love those numbers, isn't it great? The, the lived experience for it, though was he was working as a, a shopkeeper and suddenly he could do all the things that he wasn't doing previously. So it made a massive difference to his job, his day-to-day -day life. So if that's um, wrist and hand, uh, I wanted to just look at what was available for a whole body stretch routine. Now, some of you might be sat there with problems only at the wrist and hand and not perhaps skin tightening or, or contractures elsewhere. Some of you will have it more widespread. When we see patients in clinic, we'll assess that and we might well say, okay, if it is just wrist and hand, we don't know if it might go to other places. It may do, it may not, but it's maybe a good habit to once a month do a full body stretch routine and just check you've still got the movement you used to have. So if it's not affecting you anywhere other than the hands, this is just a monthly MOT type thing. If you have got uh, areas of muscle or skin tightness, then <coughs> stretching them off we think can have benefit. Um, if you look at those hand stretches I just taught you, the crucial thing is that they're auto-assisted. So you're stretching as far as you can and then the auto-assist is you're pushing it further. And we know in scleroderma a regular stretch is good, a stretch with a push at the end is better. Uh, that push could be from you, it could be from your significant other in your life, uh, in a supportive, encouraging uh, way. Um, and um, we spent a lot of time looking at exercise booklets and resources for people with scleroderma. And, and then I was, I was shown this from the uh, Cochin uh, team in, in Paris. And the French health system, people tend to travel a bit further to get to their uh, national centres. So they have a massive number of um, scleroderma patients at this, this hospital in Paris. And they have a good resource to work uh, for that reason. Now, there, were, there was some very poorly printed paper copies of this uh, out in the coffee room that some of you would have picked up. Um, if you'd like a digital version, it will come with the slide set from today, or you can get in touch with me and I can send out the uh, ooh, larger pictures. Um, but just to have a think about the comprehensive nature of it, it could be you need to do treatment for your fingers, your wrists, your elbows, your shoulders, your anterior chest wall, your hips, your knees, uh, your legs, and I've got a separate presentation for your mouth. So. Um, the, the routine that they look at with this, this, this uh, um, French program is um, holding each stretch for 20 seconds and performing it five times. So I did say there's a thumb-based stretch there. Um, and whilst you can pull it yourself, you can also push it on a piece of furniture to give that extra stretch. It could be, and this is one of the things we measure, is how wide the thumb can spread to get around a glass or, or a jar or something similar. And they've got some auto-assisted uh, finger stretches, rather like we did. Now it's done here with all four fingers at the same time, which is a really good time saver, but it does assume that your fingers might have similar levels of um, flexibility. Uh, and, and there it is, the ind individual fingers that again we've just looked at. Um, you can put your whole body weight behind stretches, for instance on this uh, wrist routine, uh, the same there. Uh, and perhaps with something to, to hold the, the, the wrists and hands in a more natural position as well. Um, and then similarly for the elbow, it's trying to find a way that you can stretch it with a bit of extra force. Uh, or even, this is, this is quite interesting, if you sit on your hands, you can use your whole body weight to force that elbow a bit straighter. Um, Similarly for bending the elbows, it could be worth using a, a, a stick, a walking stick or, or something similar here to uh, encourage that further movement, which could be your slightly uh, more flexible elbow or shoulder pulling it further. It could be your uh, exercise buddy is pulling that stick to encourage it to go a little bit further. Um, okay, and, and also some other um, exercises uh, to pull on the, the stretch there. I think if you looked at this resource, you could probably spend six or seven hours a day doing these exercises. <laughs> That's not what we're recommending. Uh, like I say, once a month to check the movement's still good, and then perhaps choosing your top two or three to perform on a daily basis for areas that might be more relevant for you or more limited uh, for you. 
Um, some of you will struggle to get on and off the floor, so there are ways to adapt this. And I think we need to think about individualised exercise programmes. Taking away the leaflet, looking at these online is absolutely fine, but if you need uh, to do something regularly, it could be worth seeing your physiotherapist and saying, can you make this work for me? Um, perhaps your physiotherapist won't have heard of scleroderma, but if you show them this booklet, they'll hopefully cotton on to the ideas, the principles, the areas we'd like you to work. Okay, uh, so that's something to come back to uh, at your leisure. I'm just going to talk about um, this uh, second uh, case study. Um, so this lady was uh, an inpatient with us actually. So uh, we do offer an inpatient service where people will come in for a week or two and receive everything all at once. So if they're travelling from a distance, we can make sure they have their physiotherapy, occupational therapy, their investigations uh, and their medical review all in that same uh, admission. Um, it is going out of fashion, that form of care, but it was a great way for us to get to patients um, and whilst they were stuck in the ward they would commit to physio before life got back on top of them at home. Um, so uh, this lady attended as a 56 year old with quite recent um, diagnosis uh, at that stage. You can tell how long I've been working in this area, I thought it was really recent, this is March uh, 2009, so this is more than 10 years ago I met this lady. Um, but over time, she really did progress in an unusual manner. So this is her wrist x-ray, and you can see um, that big white clump, which is a calcification deposit, and it left her exceedingly limited in her wrist uh, movement, and rather different to case study one. This wasn't a, a break that could be resolved. It was something we had to learn to work around. Uh, the, the toughest part is she was a very keen tennis player, and this was a passion for her, but also the tennis club was a bit of a social club as well, so we wanted to maintain that as best we could within the limitations that she had. So we gave her a five part programme, we got her regularly stretching the wrist, regularly stretching the ankles, um, we worked on heat in the area to try and keep it as supple and loose as possible, we talked about pacing her exercises, the keep moving is a whole body stretch routine, and then she came back to me a few weeks later and said, you know what, I've been working with my tennis coach and he's given me a few things to do and a few pointers and thinking about how I position myself and how I use the racket and it's a lighter racket with a smaller handle size and I thought, actually that's as good physio as anything else because it's something you're passionate about and something that you'll do regularly. So for her, that tennis coach was um, a better physio than I was, I would suspect. Uh, so what happened? Well, she did keep her mobility quite well at the wrist. The grip strength improved and she was still hitting a tennis ball regularly um, at the club. So that's a little bit of personalising uh, your physiotherapy. Thinking about the other papers that were in the big survey, there was three that looked at general fitness work. Um, and it was either on a treadmill, uh, on exercise bikes, or a combination of the two. And they all showed quite good improvements in fitness levels. Um, the Shoemaker study is particularly interesting. It looked at pulmonary artery hypertension and what that can do to your breathing. And it compared people with pulmonary artery hypertension of a primary nature, so no other diagnosis, to people with scleroderma and pulmonary artery hypertension. Both groups increased their fitness at the same kind of rate. So the scleroderma per se didn't prevent an improvement in uh, general fitness. However, you're not all going to go and do 30 minutes on a treadmill twice a week, and I wouldn't necessarily encourage that. There is more resources, and we know even a brisk walk for 10 minutes should count as exercise. Define oh. risk however you like. Um, this is uh, our physio department, and we've got this health board, and on there it has all kinds of options of things you could do that might be exercise or activity, so finding something that works for you, rather like that lady with the tennis club. And, um, of course, the Chief uh, Medical Officer has been, produced these documents with regards to what we should be aiming for. Um, the one on the far side is the modern version. I wanted to keep this one just because it's got the salt air there, and I thought I'd just pick up the country a little bit for you. Uh, oh. um, but the idea is looking at either 75 minutes of vigorous exercise or 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. Now, for some of you, that will sound rather uh, a distant... Uh, aspiration and we're not saying that has to be the case if you're living with a more severe version uh, of the diagnosis 
But it, it, it does look at the idea of chunking that. So it could be if it takes you five minutes to climb the stairs and you're climbing the stairs five times a day, well, that's 25 minutes of done each day. So it's how you add that up and how you build that um, into a routine. Um, there are some really good resources online. So Moving Medicine has an inflammatory uh, rheumatic section which covers scleroderma amongst other rheumatology diagnoses and it lists kind of things you could do at home, things at groups or classes, and uh, tips to maintain it. Um, it also looks at why we should be thinking about your cardiovascular health, your fitness. Um, ah, yes, and then my, my next case study is a lady um, who struggled uh, with this. So Nicola, I spoke to Nicola this morning on the way up and she was quite happy for me to share this story, by the way. Um, she was in um, the Daily Mail as the real life Tin Man. Is this familiar to anyone, this story? Yeah. Um, and I first met her when we were on stage together at the National Rheumatology Conference. And I was doing the kind of talk I've done today. And then she came on and blew the audience away with a lived experience of what it was like. Um, but digging under that, what I hadn't quite realised that even 40 miles from where she was in Southport to coming to Manchester where the conference was, it meant being at the train station at 6.30 in the morning and it meant a lot of preparation to get out of the house and get uh, active. Um, she does spend a lot of time each day just loosening up to be able to keep as active as possible and for you guys it could be the aim is to maintain your current levels of fitness and fight against the potential deterioration uh, which Nicola is doing fantastically. Um, so I did say I'd take you on a bit of a world tour. Um, this is uh, something that I presented for the Travelling Fellowship, so newer rheumatologists who were interested in scleroderma, and we are trying to get every rheumatologist interested in scleroderma, uh, they, they came to visit us and I wanted to give the breadth of the ideas that are being looked at. So if we go to the Czech Republic, I briefly mentioned Maya and her work looking at more intensive um, physiotherapy. It did show quite significant improvements um, in movement, in flexibility, uh, in fitness as well with a more intensive programme. Um, if we go to Sweden, um, Henrik Peterson is looking particularly at the shoulder. Is there a way that the shoulder and elbow hand can be improved by shoulder specific analysis and work in scleroderma? Uh, moving to Denmark, and this is quite interesting, so I presented my wax bath study and Three posters away was a group from Denmark presenting their study where they compared wax bath to warm water. So put your marigolds on and put your hands in the sink at a fairly warm temperature. And they found the outcomes were fairly similar for the warm water and the wax. So that kind of agreed with what we had found and that might stop the big rush online for you guys buying wax baths uh, this evening. It could be warm water with some gloves to protect you is enough to heat the hands to get the benefits. Um, by the way, if you love wax baths and you've already got one, I'm not saying to stop there. It works for lots of people and perhaps the problem we have in research is it takes people as a clump and we might find that five out of ten is a fantastic resource, but if five out of ten don't get the benefit, overall it gets thrown out. So there may be some more on that in the future. Um, you may have heard of SPIN, the Scleroderma Patient Centred Intervention Network, which is a group, um, well actually the group are from Canada, but um, Linda Quackenboss from the Netherlands did a RCT uh, looking at a specific SPIN hand programme, and again that's shown some pretty good uh, feedback. If we go to Hungary, and this is the nicest idea I think, if you imagine you're in Hungary at this stage, of course, you've got natural geothermal uh, resorts there, so there is warm mud baths for you to put your hands or feet or whichever part of your body into, and that did show some really good improvements of thermal baths, mud baths, whirlpool therapy, and soft tissue massage. So like I say, there are other parts of the world where perhaps uh, the, the natural geology of the area makes it easier to offer these kind of uh, treatments. Um, Interestingly, if you go to Germany, there's, there's a, a bit more of a push towards lymphatic drainage as their treatment of choice. So looking at trying to move the swelling within the hands or other areas and, and keep that circulation of lymph going. Um, and the other thing that we pulled out of the German work is that um, 
not everyone was accessing physiotherapy as much as they should do. So 43% of the patients looked at received physio, so 57 didn't, which is a bit concerning, I think. Um, we'll go to the USA, and they looked at, well, what makes you attend physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and what makes you not? So you were more likely to seek out your physiotherapist or occupational therapist if you were on disability benefits, if you were older, if you had uh, a, a longer time in education, if you had the diagnosis for less than three years, if you had more moderate to severe joint contractures, or if you had several large joint contractures. So that's probably relevant for this country as well. There's certain cohorts of patients that will more readily present to rehabilitation but I would encourage you all to have a chat with your local physio, your local OT, and see what they can add to your programme. Um, finally, on our world tour, we'll go back to Japan. And I, I, I did say how much I like the routine. You all love it now, you've tried it. Um, they did look at, well, what happens five years later or nine years later? And unfortunately, the studies were slightly less exciting for the nine-year benefit. So I did say a month worth of exercise gave you a benefit of one year. That month worth of exercise doesn't last for five years or nine years, so it's going back to that kind of use it or lose it idea. So get a routine that you can do regularly. You could do the best routine in the world. If you get fed up with it after a month and stop doing it, it will stop working for you uh, a fairly decent period um, after. So with that comes the role of one of the reasons I'm keen to be stood here today is Actually, what we're trying to do is, from a physiotherapy point of view, is give you a routine that works for you and becomes a habit. And if you voluntarily adapt that behaviour, it will become a habit and will benefit you uh, in the long run. So, um, that's the first bit of what I wanted to talk through. We're going to move more specifically on to the, the, the mouth um, now. And this is something we get asked uh, quite regularly uh, in our clinics, so uh, mouth tightening can be a, a problem in, in lots of ways. Uh, let me describe them. Um, if you do have decreased mouth opening, it can impact on your ability to eat. Uh, it can impact on how you get on with your dentist and what dental care they can provide with you. And it can impact on your talking and your, your sociability um, as well. So this was a big area we started to look at uh, in the last... Um, probably six or seven years. Um, there's, a, there's a guy who um, is very much in the forefront on this, and he's easy to remember because he's Dr. Leader. He's the leader on what we do in mouth care. Uh, a dentist from Boston, and his research in 2011 uh, described 28% of people had difficulty finding a dentist who was prepared to treat them. So you go to your dentist, you say you've got sclerodema, and they run a mile and say, sorry, we're full up. Um, on top of that, struggling to find a dentist, 63% said they wouldn't recommend their dentist to other people with scleroderma. So this is a problem. Um, if we think about mouth opening, um, you can measure how far your mouth opens. A few of you are. I think you're measuring your mouth open rather than yawning at the moment. Um, but uh, your normal mouth opening should be 45 to 55 millimetres if you're female, 50 to 60 millimetres if you're male. We define limited movement as less than 30 millimetres, um, which is a, is a measure both for scleroderma and for other people with other reasons of having limited mouth opening. So what's happened research-wise? Again, these three studies made it into that literature review I did a number of years ago. 1984 was the first uh, published research looking at a series of six facial stretches. And what they found was people with um, limited movement uh, th th were able to get three <coughs> millimetres more mouth opening. They then did this more hands-on, auto-assisted stretch and it gave you an extra 5.6 millimetres, so it doubled the benefit if you were able to do the last three exercises I'm going to teach you in a moment. Uh, there was a repeat of that study in Italy a few years later, and again uh, back in America in 2010. Crucially, the mouth opening got better, but that made speaking and eating easier and oral hygiene easier as well, so it has a real impact day to day. So, uh, the exercises can be split into three different categories. 
the first one called facial grimacing that you're all going to love doing in a moment. Um, oral stretches that you're going to slightly less love and oral augmentation that most of you will hate if you try it, but some of you will see the benefit. So uh, let me take you through these. I should say the images are from our um, SI UK day, I think in 2013, 14, 15, so these are contemporaries of yours who agreed to have their images shared doing these exercises. Um, and the first one is, is very easy. And are you all prepared to join in? Yes. So if you could start with exercise number one, you're just going to open your mouth as wide as possible. Okay? I, I should say, if you're doing this at home, you can close your mouth, thank you. Um, if you're doing this at home, <laughs> you might want a warm towel or a warm flannel on the face for a few minutes beforehand. It could be you have a hot shower before you move on to the routine. Each of the stretches, 10 seconds to 20 seconds, we'll not do that today because otherwise we'll be here till it gets dark. Um, uh, second one, similar idea, but this time keep your lips folded over your teeth and then you're going to open your mouth as far as possible. Okay, uh, number three, you're going to place your hand upon your jaw and pull that jaw down as far as you can. Uh, number four, sorry, the numbers are, are yeah, number four, uh, I think we're on. Purse your lips, so pushing the lips together, feeling the stretch under the nose, perhaps, and on the, the, the bridge there. Okay, you'll all like this one. Uh, next one, you're going to puff your cheeks out, so a bit of air in there. Give them a nice big stretch. Ah, this is my favourite. You're all going to do a very exaggerated smile on this one. So again, pulling out the stretch, feeling at the top of the lips there. Hands on the jaw again. We're going to take it all the way to one side. This is all voluntary, by the way. I don't want anybody going home with a sore jaw. And then the same the, the other way. And this is a tricky one, you're trying to move the jaw forward, so it might take two hands to get that stretch. Um, now, this one is one of my favourites, particularly if you've got tight skin around this area. So, um, this is called the silent scream, and you'll see why when you do it. So, you open the mouth first, then you look upwise, and then keeping the head in the same position, you bring the jaw up. So, open and you'll feel it all the way around these tissues. Okay, so that was the routine that was established in 1983, I think it was. They then did this extra study of adding these extra bits, and this was found to double the amount of improvement in mouth opening you've got. I'm telling you that because you're not going to like doing them. Uh, the first one, you can put your right thumb in the corner of the left side of your mouth. Again, this is optional, depends on your thumb function as well. And pull it across. Uh, same the other way, so left thumb in the corner of the right side of the mouth. And then the next one, oh, where's that gone? Is both together, so both thumbs in. I'm feeling across. Okay. Um, so that's, 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 that's pushing it a little bit. The final one is what's called oral augmentation. I would say if you go home and want to search, I wouldn't recommend Google searching oral augmentation. You get all kinds of <laughs> So perhaps just stick to my slides if you want to um, The idea with oral augmentation is you use tongue depressors, which is the things your dentist will use. Um, and you place them between uh, your premolars on one side and your molars on the other side. Uh, so these are the tongue depressors, and this is what it looks like. So um, <laughs> it isn't very nice. Uh, I get a 50% response of people saying, I don't like this exercise at all, which is fine. Generally, if you've got a dry mouth with your scleroderma, it does make this slightly easier because with a standardly lubricated mouth, you end up dribbling for about five minutes when you're doing this exercise. The nice thing about it is, like this chap, you might do it with 12 tongue depressors, 
And then next time, actually, I'm getting a bit loose. I can do it with 13 or 14, so you can judge how you progress. Um, I'd love to say we provide them on the NHS. We don't, but you can pick a, a, a pack of 50 or 100 for four or five pounds, so it's a, a workable um, option. Uh, I've not yet fully studied how long it lasts using these slobbery tongue depressors before you want to replace them, but that's up to your own individual discretion. This is something that's been going on for a while and it does show benefits, but the latest version of it is, could you have a manual device that better holds your mouth open for you? I'll let you just digest. It, it, it does look a little bit like a form of torture, yeah. Um, and I've always been interested in thinking, well, could this do it better than the sticks? I suspect it would. But then we saw, well, it's £400, and if you were doing a study, you'd need 40 of these. And we did the maths and thought, OK. But fortunately, at the Spend Over World Congress last year, I walked past this poster. Um, I, I think I was so excited about the poster, the picture's quite blurry, so it doesn't come out very well. But this is an occasional therapist from Belgium who was doing some research on precisely that. So she'd had four people using that machine of torture, uh, and three people doing the standard exercises you've just tried, and after three months she found both groups had further improvements in their mouth opening, but there wasn't a difference between one group and the other. However, it did prove that this is a tolerable thing to do. Um, so, again, finding ways that work for you that become regular habit seems a good idea there. Um, we've produced a booklet on this. Uh, have I got it here? Oh, yes. So you'll have all seen this lovely booklet that SRUK have done. Uh, it was myself and it was John Paulin from Bath. Um, I did all the exciting pictures. He did the highly intelligent scientific stuff. So um, this is a bit from his text. Think about what you might do for a dry mouth problem. Um, and and um, it's not my area specifically, but it looks at salivary substitutes, sipping water, uh, sugar-free gum, or, or salivary stimulant medications as options to help uh, with the dry mouth. And that's there in your take-home leaflet if you want. So uh, let's have a look at a lady who kindly went through this program for us. Um, attending with a number of issues with her uh, uh, limited systemic sclerosis, and we measured her mouth opening at 40 millimetres, so it was less than we'd want, but it wasn't considered microstomia for her. Uh, we also looked at her posture and did some work on that, and then the routine we worked through, she, she lived a distance away, so she came once a month uh, over a three-month period. Um, I'll just let you digest uh, that time. Um, so we did some stretches, we did the work with the tongue depressors, and, and this chap here is an, an Angolan gentleman uh, who was found with a new trick of putting Coke bottles into his mouth, which developed quite extreme levels of mouth opening capabilities um, for him. Uh, he doesn't have scleroderma, okay. <laughs> in case you haven't guessed. And um, so what happened? Well, I said sorry, it was a bit long of a tree appointment. So we were on 12 sticks when this lady came back at two months. She was doing 42 mill millimetres on the mouth opening, um, and she managed about 10 minutes of those sticks in her mouth each evening to gradually increase the movement. She got up to about 15 minutes uh, 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 four weeks later, and the movement had really started to shift. 45 millimetres. Suddenly she was in the normal bracket for female mouth opening, and it was making a difference in her day to day. Final time I saw her within this program was 17 sticks got in there, so she got an extra five sticks in there, and 46 millimetres of stretch. So it took a while. With all of our physio programs, it takes a while. It's not going to happen overnight. For this lady, it was five months, but we've got her right back to very nearly the average amount of mouth opening. So um, I, I slightly overrun, but that's because it's, it's a subject I'm quite passionate on. My take home messages is, is firstly, whilst that first study looked at the five year uh, progression and potential limitations in movement, actually with a workable exercise program, we can fight against that and we can improve movements. This isn't a deteriorating pattern per se, and with a program that works for you, and with a bit of luck with disease progression generally, we can get your movements better. 
Um, you can get your strength back in combination with that as you start to increase your flexibility. And so far as your fitness goes, cardiovascular activity, find a passion, find something that works for you, find an exercise you can do with a friend, a family member, somebody that drags you out when you're not feeling so uh, keen, and get in habits uh, with that. Um, so I, I did say I work at Salford as, a, as a, something of a national centre for scleroderma, so I should thank um, the whole team uh, there. Hopefully you'll recognise Ariane Herrick, sat on this side, and possibly some other members of the team from previous such meetings. Uh, I have to thank SIUK for allowing me to develop this interest and the research funding that came with it. And also all the people that I've met with this condition who attended Salford who bought, built, built up this passion for me and the evidence behind what we do.